Uh, we will start the afternoon program, and uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Charles Epstein, and uh, he was he had received his PhD degree uh, from New York University, and he's now uh, uh, a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So let's welcome Professor Epstein. about that. Did that work? OK. It's very nice to be here. I'm, as I said to the people who invited me to the meeting, that I don't work in large data or small data. Maybe I work on synthetic data. And so what I'm going to talk about today um, has to do with uh, a problem called the phase retrieval problem, which is a pretty important problem in applications and had a, had a slight uh, increase in popularity for a few years. I think it's gone back to its less popular stage. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, how I learned a lot of kind of interesting theoretical aspects of this problem by doing a lot of computer experiments. So oh, I have to be over here. Yeah. So uh, it's a little unconventional. And it's sort of at the intersection of mathematics, numerical analysis, and, and mathematical physics. And most of the work here is joint with Alex Barnett, Leslie Greengard, and Jeremy Magland. OK, so I'm going to talk about an inverse problem that arises in the subject of coherent diffraction imaging. So it's a technique that uses very high energy monochromatic light, so either x-rays or electrons. And you form, you try to make high resolution images of either living or not living things. And the resolutions that you're looking for are in the 1 to 10 nanometer range, so very, very high resolution imaging. So the photons that we use to illuminate the samples are in that energy range, 0.1 to 10 keV. And we need really good quality monochromatic coherent radiation. And it used to be totally unobtainable. And now it's very easy to get. So every particle accelerator in the world besides CERN became obsolete when they built CERN. And so they had to find something to do with all these old particle accelerators. And they turned them into what are now called advanced light sources. And so the advanced light sources produce this kind of very high quality monochromatic radiation. And you can get time on the beam and illuminate your samples. OK, so what we do is we, we model the object using a function, a scalar function, rho of x. And what that does is it just describes the object's devi the refractive index of the object as it deviates from the vacuum. And then what we do is we, uh, we uh, send monochromatic x-rays through the object. And then in the far field, we try to measure the outgoing radiation. And there's a classical calculation going back probably more than 100 years that shows that to leading order, the outgoing field is just the Fourier transform of this row. But because we're measuring at a very, very short wavelength, you can't actually measure the phase. You can only measure the intensity of the scattered field. So rho hat squared is what you can measure. So just uh, as a point of a reference, rho hat squared is not a useless thing to measure. It's the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And so if you measure rho hat squared, you can reconstruct the autocorrelation function for free. Now, that's not the same thing as the object, but it's not, not useless information. So as we heard, actually, in, in Joe's talk yesterday, there's a whole approach to imaging that just uses the autocorrelation function and higher order correlations to, to do the whole reconstruction problem. OK, so we're going to assume that rho is real value. That means there's no significant absorption of radiation. There are also x-ray bands where you can assume that rho is not only real valued but non-negative, which is an extremely useful thing to know. And a, the, a, a, a point here is that you need, to, you need to know something about rho besides the modulus squared of its Fourier transform. So we call this auxiliary information. So you need to know something about the function in order to be able to recover the unmeasured phase. So that's what we want to do. We want to recover the phase of the Fourier transform. Okay, so here are just some examples. That's this, the far field pattern produced by scattering off of a semicircular hole in a, in, in a metal plate. And this is the far field pattern produced by the far, by an equitri equilateral triangular hole in a plate. And that's what an actual genuine diffraction pattern produced by a yeast spore at a half a keV looks like. Of course, the colors aren't real. But that gives you an idea 
of the kind of data that you collect. It gives you an idea of the intensity. OK, so we need to estimate the, the unknown phase. And this is a problem that arises in x-ray crystallography, and it fast, first arose in x-ray crystallography. Interestingly, in x-ray crystallography, it's a provably unsolvable problem. But uh, a famous crystallographer named David Sayer thought that as a consequence of Nyquist's theorem, that you could probably use this data, the, the modulus of rho hat squared, to uh, reconstruct the full Fourier transform of a compactly supported object. Because the object had bounded support, if you collected enough Fourier data, you should be able to re recover the phase. That was his belief. So there have been a lot of attempts to solve the problem. And I would say, from the perspective of a mathematician, the success is very limited. From the, from the perspective of people from the more physical side of the subject, people who are happy getting one digit, success has been fine. But from the mathematical side, the success is very limited. And I'm going to talk about what it is that makes this problem so difficult. So it's not unrelated to the previous talk. My answers will be quite different, but it's a similar sort of a question. What makes this problem so difficult? OK, so we'll talk about the following topics, I hope. So the first thing is a model problem. So um, it's very, very uh, difficult to even talk about the real problem, because there are so many issues having to do with the measurements that you, it's very hard to start even analyzing that problem. So what I'll do is I'll replace it with a somewhat simpler problem, which is clearly a related problem. And if you could solve the simpler problem well, you could probably solve the real problem better. OK, so it's, we call it the discrete classical phase retrieval problem. And I'm only going to talk about the 2D case, but everything that I say is true in dimensions greater than 1. One dimension is a special case for the phase retrieval problem. It's a, it's a case in which, in fact, the problem is not solvable. And there are always going to be multiple solutions given the phase information. OK, so we imagine that the unknowns are just samples of this, this function rho on a uniformly spaced grid. And we call things what we call the grid J. It's a finite grid in the Z2 lattice. And uh, we call anything indexed by J an image. And we usually will talk about real valued images. But most of what we say works for complex valued images. And we always regard the images as having been periodically extended to all of Z2. So we have this lattice. And we measure what's in this little square over here. And we think of that as one period of a function that's periodic on the whole grid. So we think of everything as being periodically extended. OK. So in the model problem, our measurements are the moduli of the discrete Fourier coefficients of uh, our image. So the xj hats, the modulus of the xj hats, and they define the a sub j's. And so of course we have the same number of samples here as we have unknowns. OK, so there are important differences between these model measurements and samples of the continuum Fourier transform, but we won't have any time to talk about it. OK, now what does the measured data define? It defines a torus. Well, a torus is, of course, a product of circles. And in fact, if you look at this torus in the Fourier representation, it's a product of round circles in coordinate planes. It's, but but you, should, you should just have some numbers in mind. For a typical image, um, the cardinality of the set J would be a million for a two-dimensional image. For a three-dimensional image, a billion. So it's a product of a lot of circles. Very high-dimensional problem. OK, now, remember that we, we take our image and we, we make it periodic. And so we can, we can take any vector and we can translate our image by that vector. So we just move where it's sitting in the physical plane. And the, the thing I want to point out here is that if I either translate it or if I reflect it through the origin, so I just replace x sub j with x sub minus j, all of these images have exactly the same modulus Fourier data. So right off the bat, we know that the issue of uniqueness is a non-trivial issue in this problem. Our measurements don't uniquely specify, even within this family of nice, boundedly supported images, a single image. You can translate them. You can invert them. You can do both. These guys are called the trivial associates. They all have the same magnitude Fourier data. OK, so we need to have auxiliary information. So we call S sub x the support of the unknown image. So that's just the collection of indices where x sub j is not 0. That's the support. The indices where the, 
image is actually not zero. And we assume that this set is contained in a rectangular subset. So we have j is some piece of the square lattice. And we assume that the support of our object lies in a rectangular subject subset whose side lengths are at most half of the side lengths of j. Oops. Half of the side lengths of, oops. Yes, half the side lengths of j. So to solve this problem, therefore, what we're doing is we're looking for an image with the given measured magnitude DFT data and an image that vanishes. Oh, that should not be an S, I'm sorry. S is our estimate for the, esti for the, uh, for the support. So we have a subset S, which is an estimate for the support of X, and we want to find an image X sub J who vanishes for J not in S. So this is an important thing, so let's write it on the board. B sub S consists of the X such that X sub J is zero for J not in S. That's just a linear subspace. Those are linear conditions. OK, so the standard way to sort of formulate the phase retrieval problem as a geometric problem is to say, we're looking for points in the intersection of this torus and that linear subspace. So in the standard 2D problem, the torus is about a half a million dimensions, and the linear subspace is about a quarter of a million dimensions. And the theorem says that, um, generically, this consists of a finite collection of points, and all those points are translates or inversions of one point. So they're all trivial associates of one point. OK, we can also replace the auxiliary information with the knowledge that the image is non-negative, along with an estimate on the support of its autocorrelation image. And then what we do is we replace the problem of looking for an intersection of the torus with the linear subspace. We look for the intersection of the torus with the positive orthant. So B plus is just the set of images with non-negative entries. OK, so the geometry of these intersections plays a very decisive role in determining how difficult the problem is. So unless the support estimate is exactly equal to the support, the problem does not usually have a unique solution. Usually, there's going to be some trivial associate that has support in the same set. So if my estimate for the support is a set that looks like that, then I can translate this object a little bit, and it still has support in that same set. And all of those translates will give solutions to the phase retrieval problem. So unless you have, you have a knowledge of the exact support of the object, which is very unusual in a practical setting, the problem will not have a, a unique solution. Uh, if positivity is auxiliary information, then in fact all trivial associates are also solutions. OK, so there's a theorem due to a, an electrical engineer named Monson Hayes that says generically all solutions are trivial associates of a single one. So there's really just one object whose image you've obtained, and you just moved it around or reflected it through the origin. OK, so let's talk about the algorithms. How do people solve this problem? Let's talk about it in a slightly more general setting. Suppose I have two subsets, A and B, of a, of a Euclidean space Rn, and I want to find a, a point in the intersection. So what I do is I define a map P sub A, which is the nearest point map. So it maps, I have A, this will be my set A, and P sub A just maps to the closest point in A. And P sub B maps to the closest point in B. <clears throat> now, unless A and B are convex sets, these sets, these maps are not defined everywhere. But they're always defined on the complement of a hypersurface. And the fact that they're not defined anywhere doesn't really play too much of a role. So the classical approach to finding points in the intersection is called alternating projection. So in functional analysis, this was a method introduced by Chan von Neumann. In image reconstruction, it was first, uh, a the first attempt was by Gertzberg and Saxton. And then a very important improvement to the algorithm was given by Jim Feenup. And this is how it works. Choose a random starting point, And then you just iterate like this. You first project onto B. Then you project onto A. That gives you the next iterate. And you just continue doing this over and over and over again. And this is called alternating projection because you alternate between the two projections. I should say that if A or B are linear subspaces, then these are just orthogonal projections. OK, so it's pretty clear that any point in the intersection is a fixed point of the map. And for a lot of years, 
it was, uh, was hoped, and in the physics literature, of course, it was stated that these were the only fixed points. Um, but eventually it became clear that this was not the case. Now, if you look in the imaging literature, what people will say is that the alternating projection algorithm stagnates. And it's not 100% clear what they meant by that. But I think the statement is just completely false. And it's something that we can really understand by doing experiments. We'll talk about that first. But let's talk about the, the, the replacement algorithm. So it became pretty clear that alternating projection didn't work. This was in the 80s. Jim Feenup also introduced a new algorithm. So these are called hybrid input-output algorithm maps. And so it, they're built out of sort of combinations of the two projections, the previous iterate. And traditionally, they would put this parameter beta into it. I'm only going to talk about the case where beta is equal to 1. So this is the case where beta is 1. So what you do is you reflect the point across the B set. So the reflection is always defined by that formula. If B happens to be a linear subspace, then this is, in fact, the usual orthogonal reflection that has B as a fixed point set. But it's defined whenever, wherever P sub B is defined. And so you write that combination of things down, and that's what we call the, uh, the difference map algorithm. OK. Now, if A and B are convex sets, then it's been known for a long time that either algorithm will converge to an intersection point. Now, in the phase retrieval problem, our A set is this torus. Now, the torus is very, very far from being convex. It's a product of circles. You can just think about the picture in the plane. A circle is not convex. It's not the disk. It's the circle. The problem with the disk is the disk includes 0. We don't want to include 0. We only want points on the circle. OK, so to have somewhat better intuition for these algorithms, the best thing to do is to um, look at the case where A and B are linear subspaces. Now, the, the case that's typical, the, 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 right, the right hypotheses to make to get sort of a picture about phase retrieval is the sum of the dimensions is actually less than the dimension of the ambient space. So these typically will only intersect at 0. And in fact, though, it's useful to think about what happens if they intersect in a positive dimensional subspace. So we call that f. So then what we do is we take the orthogonal complement of, the, of that subspace in the two pieces, and we take the orthogonal complement of the sum of the two pieces. We call that, that, that thing c, the center manifold. Then we have some representation for points in Rn in terms of these subspaces. And the important thing turns out to be the, this is the A0 and B0 subspaces. And the important thing turns out to be the angles between these two subspaces. So how do you understand that? Well, you take ortho, orthonormal basis for the two subspaces. You build um, this SVD. And you look at the uh, singular values in that SVD. And those are the cosines of the angles between sort of extremal directions in the subspaces. And in particular, uh, the two subspaces will intersect if and only if the sigma j's are 1. OK, so now we can write for the linear case what these maps look like in these coordinates. So this is the alternating projection map. So this is A, B, the intersection between A and B, and the center manifold. So in the alternating projection case, one iterate knocks out the center manifold. The intersection never changes. And then what happens is the, the A and B components slowly converge to 0. And the rate they converge to 0 is determined by the angles between the two subspaces. OK, so this is a similar, similar picture for the difference map. Here, both the intersection of A and B and the center manifold directions are fixed for all time. So the map is the identity in those directions. And then this describes what happens transverse to those directions. And they also will converge to 0 at rates determined by the angles between a naught and B naught. OK, so that's the linear case. And the linear case already has some very bad news contained within it. When you linearize this map at the intersection point, you find that there are lots of directions in which the linearization is neutrally stable. In fact, it's the identity. There's no reason to think it's going to be a contraction. This would be regarded largely as bad news in the field. OK, so let's first of all look at alternating projection and see what it really does. So we're going to, first of all, try alternating projection on image data, synthetic image data. So we're going to build an image. And uh, we're then compute its DFT data. And we're just going to apply this. 
And we're just going to do what I said. We're going to pick a random starting point and then run many iterates. Now, this is the result of these experiments. So I did, I think, 150 random restarts. So the blue curve, that is the distance to the closest exact intersection point. The light blue curve, or the cyan curve, that's the distance between successive iterates. I'm, I'm sorry, between, uh, that, that's the data error. So that's the distance between the two submanifolds I'm trying to find an intersection point. And the red curves, those are the distances between successive iterates. And I point out here that this is a semi-log plot, so that's a logarithmic scale over there. And what we see by looking at that picture, just casually for a second, is that the, state, the statement that the algorithm stagnates is just completely wrong, it always converges, right? You see it's going beautifully down to machine precision here. The distance between successive iterates is less than or equal to 10 to the minus 16. And you see this is true, well, it converges at different rates and different trials. This guy hasn't quite decided if it's going to converge yet. But what we see is alternating projection does not stagnate. Alternating projection converges. It just doesn't converge to an answer to our problem. OK, so that's why this algorithm was eventually abandoned. So I should say, what it converges to is non-zero minima of the Euclidean distance between the two subsets. It turns out, if you look at this distance between A and B, every minimum, every pair that defines a minimum defines an attracting fixed point for the alternating projection algorithm. Now you might say, how do I know there are any? Right? I have these two submanifolds of Rn, very, very high dimensional. How do I know that this function has non-zero minima? Well, I refer you to that picture. It has many, many, many non-zero minima. And you can do the following experiment. You can say, take two million starting points, run the algorithm, and what you will learn is it converges every single time, and every single time it converges to a different point. So it has, it turns out that those two submanifolds have zillions of local minima which are not zero. Okay. Now, what about the fixed point sets for the difference maps? So if you go back to the, let me just write down what the algorithm was again. So the difference map says, take the original point and then add these two pieces to it. So what does it mean to be a fixed point of such a map? It means that that term is 0. It means that PA of RBX is PBX. But what that means is that this point, PBX, is a point on the B submanifold. And this point, PA of RBX, that's a point on the A submanifold. And they're equal. Hence, I found an intersection point. So this map is a little bit different in that the fixed points of the map are not intersection points. The fixed points of the map are solutions to that equation. but once you've found a solution of that equation, you've found an intersection point. It points to an intersection point. OK, so here is, what the, here is a picture to have in mind. I have two submanifolds. Let's say I have a, a line and a circle. And there's the intersection point. And this is the intersection of the normal to the circle at that point which is a plane, and the normal to the line at that point, which is another plane, they intersect in a line. And the difference map converges to points on that submanifold. We call that the center manifold. So the center manifold is the intersection of the normal bundle to the torus through the intersection point and the normal to the linear subspace. Okay, And that is what the iterates of the, of the difference map will converge to if it ever happens to converge. OK, so we call that the center manifold. It's a very large dimensional manifold. So in our typical 2D case, it's a quarter of a million dimensions. Um, the linearization of this map at the intersection point is neutrally stable. So in effect, it will never converge to that point. It will always, if it converges, it will always be to some point on the center manifold distant from the intersection point. So now, it's true that the fixed points of difference maps are always related to points in the intersection by that formula. Now, what was ignored for many, many years was that there are other sets that are invariant sets for difference maps. And in fact, if I t again, I look at this distance function between the two submanifolds, any critical point 
of the distance function between the two submanifolds defines what we call a generalized center manifold. That is, the normal bundle to the torus intersect with the orthogonal complement of the linear subspace always intersects in a subspace, which is the same dimension, more or less, as the true center manifold. And it turns out that lots of these submanifolds are also attracting. They're attractors. There's no fixed point on them. So the, what happens is that the dynamics of the map is not convergent along these subsets, but the subsets themselves are attracting sometimes. So the problem that, we're, what, that I'm pointing out here is that these maps have a lot of attracting basins. Some of them have fixed points in them, and some of them don't. OK, so in the following experiment, we're going to look at the iterates of the difference map. It's going to be done in the same way. We're going to select a random point. We're going to iterate this map. Then we're going to, then we're going to find a, an approximate reconstruction. Because remember, the points, are, the points are sort of converging if they're converging to some point quite distant from either submanifold. But what I can do is I can just take my iterate and project it down, and I'll get a point there, and that gives me a sequence of approximate reconstructions, which is sort of what we're really interested in. So we're going to look at the, some, some, some uh, pictures where the red curves are the, the difference between successive iterates, which actually turn out to be the same thing as the data error. And um, the blue curves will once again show us the true errors. OK, so here's an example where I have a, an object that looks like that. It's just the sum of piecewise constant functions, radial functions. This is the support mask that I'm using. It's, I think, a one pixel support neighborhood. So I act like I know the support of the object up to a one pixel error. And after 5,000 iterates, this is the reconstruction that I got. And this is the, the blue curve is the true error. And we see it's converged to like you know 10 to the minus 8. If I ran a few more thousand iterates, I'd probably get down to machine precision. So this is a case where it looks like the algorithm is converging. It looks a little weird, the way it's converging, but it's converging. Now, here's a more typical case. Now, the images don't look too much different. But if you look at them carefully, this one is sort of fuzzier and smoother. And you see what's happened here is that that curve, that's the true error, has kind of stagnated a little below 10 to the minus 1. And the data error, the residual, is getting smaller and smaller. And in fact, what you see here is that the data error is about the square of the true error. Now, that is to say, the distance from the reconstruction to the actual uh, submanifold is about the square. Uh, so I'll draw another picture here. The reconstructions are points along a set that looks like that. And if this distance here is t, then that distance there is about t squared. That's what those two distances are. The blue distance is t. The red distance is about t squared. And you see, I already sort of told you the answer. The data, the data in that experiment right there, it suggests something very surprising. It suggests that not only is there an intersection point, the intersection is not a transversal intersection. That means that the tangent space to the torus at that point actually intersects the linear subspace in a positive dimensional subspace, not just at the single point. Now, for people who have any experience with algorithms to try to find intersection points, this is a very bad piece of information. This is something very, you're very sorry to know this, because it means that the problem is inherently very difficult. It's inherently ill-conditioned. In fact, you can prove that the, the inverse map, if it actually existed, couldn't be any better than Helder 1 half. So that means the condition number is, in effect, infinite at such a point. OK, so the, the data, this experiment, after I thought about it for about three months, suggested to me, oh, these intersections aren't transversal. And in fact, you can prove a theorem that says that that's the case. So to be able to prove such a statement, you have to have a very explicit description of the tangent space, the, the vectors that are tangent to the torus. And there's this remarkable formula that it says if you take a point in the torus, and you look at the translate in one direction, and you take the translate the op opposite direction, and you take the difference, those vectors are tangent to the torus at the point x. Now, you, you see why that's so useful, because 
if I know something about the support of x, well, I know that the support of x translated by v is just the support of x translated by v. So what it means is that if I have an estimate for the support of x, which is not that precise, then there are going to be tangent vectors, t sub v, that are also supported in this set s. Well, that means exactly that the tangent space to the torus at that point intersects the linear subspace in a non-trivial positive dimensional set. So this is generically the case. And this is what makes phase retrieval, first thing that makes phase retrieval, an extremely difficult problem. The, trans the intersections that you're looking for are almost never transversal. OK, so let's define S sub P to be the P pixel neighborhood of the support. So it'll be the set of indices that are within P of the support, actual support of my, my image. You can do a little calculation, and you can see that the dimension of this intersection is at least 2p times p plus 1. You just count the number of translates that fit into the support constraint. And, and generically, actually, this gives the exact result. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, or last or second to last, we'll see how much time this takes. Uh, so it had to do with how I was doing experiments when I first started working on this problem. And I inherited this. So this is inherited software from somebody else. They said, this is how we give, we're going to make smoother examples. We're going to take a piecewise constant example, and we're going to convolve it with a Gaussian. I mean, anybody would say that's a fine idea, right? We would say that's perfectly OK. And you just adjust the width of the Gaussian, and that gives you some measure of smoothness. It's a perfectly reasonable way to define smoother examples. And we were very interested to understand how the difficulty of this problem depend upon the smoothness, and, and in physical terms, the softness of the object. And so we did experiments like this for a long time. So this is the k equals 0, k equals 2, k equals 4, k equals 6. Clearly, the object's getting smoother and smoother. OK, and then I did the following computation. I did this calculation of the dimension of the intersection between the tangent space to the torus and the support subspace, uh, linear subspace. And I looked at it as a function of the size of this, the precision of the support constraint and the smoothness of the object. And I computed this table. And you see this table. This is the top row is just 2p times p plus 1 for a piecewise constant object. And in each successive row, the dimensions of these intersections get to be larger and larger. And needless to say, this makes the problem harder and harder. The bigger the, the failure of transversality, the more directions in which the algorithm does not ever want to converge. OK, so I looked at these numbers, and I could never really explain them. I couldn't understand why the dimensions of the subspaces actually got larger with smoothness. So I thought, maybe this is something numerical. And the reason I thought that was this, that these singular values, they're the cosines of the angles, which, again, in the physics literature, is known to be equal to 1 minus theta j squared over 2. And, and what this means is that you get, a, you get a singular value of 10 to the minus 16 for an angle of 10 to the minus 8. So you feel like, well, maybe it's just a numerical artifact. Maybe this isn't really happening. Although it was so reproducible and so independent of so many other things, I really wondered if that could be the case. Eventually, I, f I realized, you know, there has to be a better explanation for this. And eventually, I did an experiment that showed me that there really had to be an explanation. And the experiment I did, I can't, I can't, really, show you the, I can't really show you the picture, but I convolved with something that wasn't a Gaussian. In fact, I convolved with something that was not inversion symmetric, and I got a completely different answer. OK, so then this led me to thinking harder about the tangent space. So I, this is perhaps going to be a little obscure, even compared to what I set up to this point. So I'm saying, suppose I have an object which is a convolution of two objects. By this, I mean the finite periodic convolution. Everybody's familiar with that. And we have the following remarkable formula. So z is my convolved object. And let's suppose I have the tangent space, tangent vector at the vector z. On its, on its uh, magnitude torus, defined by translations in direction v, well, it's actually the same thing as if I did this on the magnitude torus to the, defined by the image x, and then convolved it with y. Or, of course, convolution is, is commutative, so it doesn't matter which way I do it. So it's this very strange fact that the tangent space to the con convolved object is the convolution of the tangent space of the one or the other. Very strange fact. OK. So in fact, if I now take 
a sum of these tangent vectors to one of these magnitude tori, the one defined by x. And I convolve it with this other guy, y. Well, that automatically is a tangent vector to the magnitude torus defined by x star y at x star y. And the support of that is contained in the sum of the supports of the two things, the tangent vector and the image y. That's just, again, familiar fact from convolution, that the, the support of a convolution is contained in the sum of the supports of the two functions. It's the same for discrete objects as well. So now, the issue here was, if I could construct a vector in the tangent space at x to the torus defined by x with small support. Let's suppose I was very ambitious, and I would like this to be contained in the set, which is the support of x itself. Then I would automatically obtain a tangent vector to x star y contained in the support of x plus the support of y just by convolving, by conforming that thing there. So then, OK, so this already was a surprising fact, which was completely suggested to me by doing these experiments. And then the remarkable thing is this. If x sub j satisfies this equation, if it's centrally symmetric, inversion symmetric, like an even function, then the set of vectors, tangent vectors at x, to the torus defined by x, with support contained in the support of x, is a set with dimension at least, well, it's a complicated formula, but in the end, it's at least actually the cardinality of the support of x divided by 2. And the reason is very straightforward when you, when you finally realize that this is what's going on. The question about support is a question about solving a system of homogeneous linear equations. You realize the following fact, that the tangent vector um, defined by a centrally symmetric image has this symmetry property also, that if you look at it at minus j, it's minus its value at j. So it vanishes at j, it automatically vanishes at minus j. So you have this system of homogeneous equations, which miraculously cut, is cut in half. So you only have to satisfy half of the equations. That's where this number comes from, with all the halves in it. So suddenly you have all these free parameters. Like this is the number of parameters. This is the number of constraints. In the end, you end up with lots of free parameters. So that means you get this big subspace of vectors with support in the given set, and that automatically produces uh, a big subspace of vectors that are tangent to your torus defined by the convolution of the two images and you, that shouldn't have been there at all. And the strange thing here is this sort of generally innocuous practice of smoothing data. I give you data. Real data is noisy data. What do we usually do with it? We, we apodize it. We multiply it by a Gaussian. If you were to do this in the phase retrieval problem, that's multiplying the Fourier transform data by a, a Gaussian is the same thing as convolving the images. What you've done is you've taken a difficult problem and you've made it vastly harder. Because what you've done is you've taken an intersection that may well have been transversal and you turn it into a very non-transversal intersection. And it becomes much, much harder to find these intersection points. And I, I want to emphasize that these were all things that were discovered purely by doing experiments. By, it, it, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how many years it took me to realize but just staring at that chart for a long, long time finally told me that there had to be a theorem in there somewhere. So maybe I'll stop there. Well, the solution space is supposed to just be a, a finite set of points. Well, OK, so this is, there's, a th there's a question about uniqueness of, of the solution. So there's a theorem. There's a theorem. The theorem is that generically the solution is unique. So what it comes down to is that you take the image and you form its Z transform. If the Z transform is an irreducible polynomial, you know, you, you, you multiply out a monomial, you get a polynomial. If it's irreducible, then the solution to the problem is unique up to, up to trivial associates. And that's generically the case. But as a practical matter, it's fairly difficult to tell from data whether or not the solution is going to be unique. The solution will always be, there will always be a finite number of choices. 
And I suspect, you know, if you could ever get the algorithms to work well enough to actually give you good images, you would probably see that there are several different images. But, I mean, because they're, 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 they're attracting basins, the attracting basins are fairly distant from one another. So what they do when they, solve, when they try to actually do this in practice is that they take the, they run the algorithm many, many times. They make many reconstructions. They try to pick the ones that look the best, and then they average them. So you could end up with a bunch of them that looked good, but they looked different. Then you'd know, oh, this isn't a case where the solution's unique. So the solution is not always unique. No, AP doesn't have a center manifold. The difference map has a center manifold. What do you mean? This is a very hard question. Um, I, so I, you do the following experiment. Um, you start off, first of all, with random. Pick a random point, run, run the difference map for 300 iterates. Then if you do the following thing, if you change the initial point by, let's say, something on the order of 10 to the minus 15, you run it for 300 iterates, you will get 300 points whose distances are all pairwise about 0.1. So it is incredibly unstable in the beginning. Then, okay, so let's say, okay, let's wait a little longer. Let's go 500 iterates and hope we found an attracting basin. 500 iterates, you can also do the same experiment, and what you'll find is it's almost as chaotic. Now, sometimes if it's going to converge, let's say you go 1,000 iterates, and maybe it'll converge to three or four digits in another 5,000 iterates. At that point, it starts to become a lot more stable, and what you learn is that, so now we're within like maybe 10 to the minus two of the center manifold. But what you learn is that if I now perturb the, the, that point by vectors of a certain size, and they don't have to be that small, it will, they will stay that, that far apart from one another. That is, they'll all be converging. So what you learn is that there aren't, there are, the center manifold, if you find an attracting fixed point, a little open neighborhood at least of that point is an attracting fixed point. So there, there are lots and lots and lots of attracting fixed points. Now, as to the sizes of the attracting basins, I don't, other than that experiment where I've, I've seen you have to get within about 10 to the minus 2 of the attracting basin to expect to stay within that, the answer is I don't, I don't really know. And there's, there's zillions of them. Because again, you have all of these critical points that don't correspond to intersections. They, they, do, attra they do define attracting basins. And I mean, I, I can show you some very interesting experiments along these lines. Yes. What the, 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 empirically, what, I, what I've learned is that, let's say for a 1024 by 1024 image, there's not much point in running more than 5,000 iterates. But you may actually do well by running 20,000 or 200,000 experiments. And then what you do is you find the ones with small residuals and you align them and average them. And that's the way you get, let's say, another digit or two. 